So let's consider volume V bounded by a surface S. And as before, our normal vector N will be perpendicular to the surface everywhere. Now we're gonna consider this volume to be filled with dye molecules. So this could be like food coloring and water. And they're gonna be relatively dilute so they don't really affect the fluid itself, what's going on. Uh, but we'll still consider that there's many, many, many of them like Avogadro's number such that we can con consider the field, the concentration field C, which would be given in number of molecules or number of particles per unit volume to be a continuum. So we can talk about a local concentration at a point, even though I'm drawing little dots in here. Now it seems logical that if we took the concentration and we integrated it over the volume, that would give us the total number of particles or molecules inside our volume. And we're gonna assume that the only way that the number that can change inside our volume, that they're not being created or destroyed by some sort of chemical reaction per se, would be as if they simply flow in or out of the volume. So if, uh, some cross the surface here, they've left the volume and therefore our, our number inside has decreased. We will use the vector notation J to denote the flux. So J will be the number per unit area, per unit time that's flowing. It'll be a vector quantity with magnitude and direction. So this would be just like the heat flux. So if we uh, do this, then what we would say is that the time rate of change of the number of particles inside our volume can only change if there's flux at the surface. This is perfectly analogous and exactly like we had in the heat flow problem. Now we've shown you a few things that uh, if we're taking our volume of integration to be a material volume, so one that's going with the flow, one that can possibly uh, deform if this fluid is being convected or carried around, then we have to be careful. We can't just simply move the derivative inside the integral. We have to use the theorem that we derived, which tells us that we now have two terms when we move our derivative inside the integral sign when our volume is changing with time. Uh, and just as we saw before, uh, we, we don't have a derivative operator here, so we can just sort of treat this integral the way we normally do. And we can use the divergence theorem to write that as the divergence of j over the entire volume. Now I can group all my terms together. And since this was an arbitrary material volume, then the term inside the integral has to be zero, and that gives us the differential form of our conservation law. Now, just like in heat transfer, uh, we have a problem that we have the concentration field, we have the velocity, we have the heat flux vector. Uh, I need to put a vector on top of that, j. So j is an unknown. For now, we're gonna assume that the fluid velocity is known by some other law or given to us, but we still don't know the vector j. So just as in heat conduction, we need a constitutive law that relates J to the concentration. In this case, it's Fick's law. And Fick's law is exactly like Fourier's law. And then we have some constant. Here it's the diffusivity, D, times the gradient of the concentration gives us the flux. This is an empirical law. And we observe it to be true uh, pretty typically when the concentration is dilute. If solutions are very, very concentrated, there's some subtleties where this might be a bad assumption. But we'll ignore that. We'll assume that Fick's law is good. And just as before, we can simply substitute this in, which will give us our final form of our equation. And I'll move the, the D outside my divergence operator, so I'll assume the diffusivity is constant. We're left with a final equation that looks very similar to what we saw when we had purely diffusive properties, so as when we talk, such as when we talked about heat conduction, except we have this additional term that relates to the, the concentration being carried around by the velocity field. So we have an equation for our concentration field inside a moving fluid. So let's consider just a simple example. Let's take a sphere, a radius r, there's some fluid coming at this sphere with some uh, characteristic velocity, uh, which is constant upstream of u infinity. And the flow is gonna go around this sphere somehow. And we're gonna assume that the velocity field 
is somehow known by some other magic. Say we've measured it. Uh, later we'll talk about how to calculate it. Let's just say we know the velocity field. So our only unknown in this problem then is C. Up here, far away from the fluid, the concentration is going to be zero. And we're going to be assume that our sphere is made out of some substance and that the concentration of, in, of our substance in the fluid is somehow given as, we'll call it C0, right there at the edge. So this thing is basically dissolving and setting the concentration in the fluid uh, right at the surface of the sphere. And as the flow goes over it, it's going to kind of carry it away. So it's going to diffuse into the fluid and kind of be carried away by it. And so we want to know how this concentration, what this concentration field is uh, in our fluid. So what we're going to do is just to figure out what the important parameters are is we're going to make our equation dimensionless. So I'm going to use red to denote dimensionless. So my dimensionless velocity, I mean concentration, my dimensionless concentration will be C divided by C naught. My dimensionless velocity vector will be V divided by U infinity. So again, my dimensionless variables will be red, so concentration divided by the initial concentration, velocity divided by the initial velocity, or the far stream velocity, x and y coordinates divided by radi the radius of the sphere, and time divided by some arbitrary constant at this point, t naught. So we could make it our change of variables, and I'm going to sort of skip the steps and just kind of write the results. So I'll write our constant parameters in blue. So again, our red variables are dimensionless and our blue uh, numbers are just sort of constants. Now, we've been, we noticed first that we have C naught in every term, so I can just get rid of that. So the actual level of the concentration doesn't matter, only the relative amount does. And the other thing is you can see that we've left T naught uh, constant. So let me just multiply through. I'm gonna just sort of pick arbitrarily uh, this term here. I could pick another term if I wanted to, but uh, Okay, and now, as before, when we, we set T naught as some arbitrary constant, so by definition, I can set it to whatever I want. So I'm gonna set it to equal R over U infinity, and that's kind of has a nice interpretation, because if you think about it, the fluid's moving at speed U infinity, this distance is R, so that's kind of the time it takes for the fluid to move across uh, kind of the distance of the sphere, so that's kind of a reasonable time scale for our problem. When I make that assumption, this parameter out here just becomes one. And so what we're left with is a single parameter, and it's called the Peclet number. And what the Peclet number does is it characterizes the strength of diffusion relative to that of convection. Uh, we can see that it's unitless because di diffusivity has units of length squared over time. Velocity has units of length over time and the radius has units of length, so the units cancel. So the Peclet number is a dimensionless number that gives us the relative strength of convection and diffusion. So when the Peclet number is large, it means we're convection dominated, and when the Peclet number is small, it means we're diffusion dominated. So let's sketch what this, uh, we suspect this might look like. So here's our sphere. Our velocity is going this way. So if the Peclet number is going to zero, it means that basically convection is very, very weak and diffusion is dominated. So we'd expect over time for the concentration field just to spread out uh, essentially radially. So it would just sort of spread out from that source and over time would sort of move further and further away. So kind of the region of the fluid would kind of fill up uh, very slowly with dye. And since diffusion is so strong and this velocity is so weak, the diffusion is much, much faster than this velocity. And so therefore things look more or less uh, symmetric and they just sort of spread out radially. Now if the Peclet number was something like a round one where uh, convection and diffusion were of comparable magnitude, we might expect now to start to see a little bit of asymmetry because things can still diffuse away from our object 
but they're also carried downstream. So if something kind of moves up this way by diffusion, it's kind of carried down downstream that way. Now, in this case, the uh, strength of convection and diffusion are comparable. So we still might expect diffusion to play a role, but now it's just the fields become sort of stretched out or elongated in the direction of the flow. Now, if we go to the other extreme limit where the Peclet number is going off to infinity, where convection dominates and there's basically no diffusion, then you might expect that our flow field, which again, we have to know by some other means, but in this case, we'll just sort of say that it looks something like this and it's known. So here's our fluid velocity. Our velocity field would follow, be following those kind of lines. Then we might expect in the, in the Peclet number infinite case where diffusion is relatively weak, that once a molecule kind of makes its way out into the fluid, it's just carried around and out the back. Whoosh. So everything that makes its way out is sort of swept around. And so that all our, our concentration is just like in a thin wake behind it. So there's no possibility that something can diffuse upstream because it'll just be pushed back and carried back away with the flow. So this is uh, sort of the transition as we move from something that's diffusion dominated to convection dominated.